morning, John chapter 18, verses uh, 1 through 11. Uh, we're going to continue in our study in John. As you can see, we're, we're getting close. I was trying to get some estimates as to when we might be done. It looks like we're going to end up about exactly almost two years uh, in the study of John, which has been just a, a huge blessing. I, I've enjoyed every moment. I hope you have too. Uh, the, the book of John is just such an insightful book. And I think this passage here is really a summation because um, this is John's last chance to really describe Jesus doing um, what Jesus does. You know, uh, yes, he's going to be doing the most important thing of his ministry in the next chapter, chapter, two chapters, dying and rising again. But really, you know, Jesus is, is, yes, he is in control, and that's what John is trying to present with this passage. He's God Almighty. He's in control of all the events. But really, he's kind of being taken from one place to another. He's no longer, uh, that power is no longer being exhibited as well as this opening part of John 18. And I think it's no mistake that John wants to emphasize with his, his dialogue the power of Jesus Christ, uh, the divinity of Jesus Christ. Uh, because really, that's been the whole point of his book. Uh, if you ever get a certain religious persuasion coming and knocking on your door, uh, talking about the fact that Jesus was God, or if he was not God, or if he was God, it was God with a, a little g, not a capital G, uh, as it was expressed to me. Uh, this is the book you should take them to. This is the book that you should study out of. Uh, it's John, because John, that's the whole driving point of, of John, is to, is to show his divinity. Yes, he explains his, his uh, humanity, which you always you want, to, you want to balance that out as well. He gives us some pictures of Christ's humanity, but a lot of his driving point is his divinity, his power, his control. And thus, his dialogue, his narrative of the, uh, the, the Garden of Gethsemane, the arrest of Jesus Christ, emphasizes his power. You'll notice, if you have a Bible that... Uh, tells you where the other passages that you know, might be found in the other Gospels, parallels the Gospels. You'll notice that this passage is found in all four Gospels. There's an account of the Garden of Gethsemane. But you know what? John is probably the most different. All the rest of them follow a similar pattern. Uh, they kind of tell the details as, as, a, as it kind of had happened. But John gives specific certain details to highlight his message. Uh, he doesn't give them all, uh, and nobody really gives them all, because you can't give them all, right? John said you would fill tons and tons of books if we were to write all the stories about Jesus Christ. And that's why his point is, he's saying, hey, I want to highlight and stress the, the, the divinity of Christ and show that. And so his story is a slightly different. It's still the same story. Let me keep that in mind. He's not inventing a new story or, or rewriting the story or trying to change uh, what was written before him, because probably the four of the Gospels were written by the time John penned these words. He's reemphasizing, he's highlighting, he's still telling the same exact story. Nothing is being changed, it's not collaborated there. It's 100% truth. Uh, we believe that, we know that, it is the truth. And he's writing under the inspiration of, of the Holy Ghost, but yet he wants to emphasize certain points. And that is the almighty power of Christ. And that's what I've titled uh, this message this morning, is The Almighty Power of Christ. And we see this. Uh, most of the other accounts, Luke especially, will describe, Luke being a doctor, uh, he's very aware of what is physically happening with Jesus Christ. He's the one that describes the water and the blood coming out of Jesus' side, which uh, is a medical explanation that Jesus Christ was indeed dead by the time that spear went into his, into his side and pierced his heart. So, and Luke, being a doctor, would have known that. He didn't, he just put it in there as, as a freebie for you to, to have, take home. Uh, but he also was the one to describe Jesus sweating drops of blood, which again is a medical condition uh, where someone is so stressed uh, that they will, blood vessels will break and they will uh, sweat drops of blood out of, their, uh, out of their body. It's happened, it's been known. It is, a, it is a medical condition. Don't ask me what the word for it is. Uh, but it is something that does happen, uh, very rarely, but it does happen. And, and uh, Luke is trying to stress his humanity, the fact that he was fully human, and he is fully human. Jesus Christ is fully human, and he still is today, uh, fully human, and we don't want to tip the scale either way. But uh, Luke is driving that point home, and he wants to express the humanity of Christ, the fact that the suffering of Christ meant a lot to Christ. It was not something he just tripped through as if it was uh, skipping through a field of daisies. It was something that was very stressful, meant a lot to him, was something he didn't want to experience. But John wants to emphasize the other side of the coin. Remember, the whole prayer of Jesus is Jesus talking about, okay, 
This is my hour. I'm ready for this. Because I know this, this, me suffering for the cause of all humanity, the world, is important. And Christ loves the Father. He knows the Father loves him. And he's ready to do this. And he's willing to do this. And he has the power to do this. And, and really, what John wants to show you is that even though it looks like Christ doesn't have any power at all, he's being led in chains from one place to another, then he's being nailed on a cross, all these what look like to, uh, would take away from the power of Christ, he really wants to express that, no, Jesus is indeed control in control of every moment of what's happening. And that's why he opens chapter 18 with this very powerful description of the almighty power of Jesus Christ. And really, we see the power of Jesus Christ. We see his foreknowing. We see his uh, just literal power knocking them over, the, the arresters. Uh, we see, um, let's see if I can get the rest of the points, the demonstration of his powerful love and then the power of his obedience uh, to God the Father, which is indeed a power. Uh, sometimes we think of obedience just submissively going about doing whatever's being told you. But no, true obedience is knowing that, hey, this is for my benefit, thus I'm going to willingly accept it and follow it. And there's a power in obedience as well. And it demonstrates his divinity. And that's what the whole point of what uh, John is writing about here. So, let's go ahead and dive straight on into this. Uh, I, I put this at the top of your notes because I, I want to give credit where credit is due. I did... This, these are partially inspired by John MacArthur, and if you're interested, to go look up his. He has a series of commentaries on, on the entirety of the New Testament, and he goes, of course, through John's Gospel, and uh, I, I thought his notes on this passage were just extremely good, so I borrowed from them. I changed them slightly uh, to fit um, my driving point here, but uh, I did borrow heavily from him, so just so that you're aware of that. And uh, I remember, just to throw this in, as, as I don't want to go too far down a rabbit trail, but... <clears throat> An elderly lady wrote to John MacArthur uh, one time and, and complained. She said, uh, you're stealing my pastor's sermons. She said, uh, I've listened to some of your messages and almost word for word, you have copied my pastor, my local pastor, his messages. I don't know how you're finding them and listening to them and stealing them, but you need to stop. John MacArthur wrote back and he said, uh, he apologized for stealing the pastor's sermons and he said, I will not do that anymore. Uh, but really the truth was the other way around. Uh, the pastor was stealing John MacArthur's sermons and uh, not giving credit where credit is due. So I stole John MacArthur's uh, message on this. So just so you know, okay, uh, don't write John MacArthur and say uh, that I was stealing his, his, or that he was stealing my messages. Uh, so just so that doesn't happen, just we'll give credit where credit is due. Um, but anyways, a demonstration of Christ's courage. In fact, John MacArthur uses the word supreme for each of these demonstrations. But I think this is a demonstration of Christ's supreme, if you want to put in there, supreme courage, his authoritative courage, uh, his foreknowing, right? Jesus knew exactly what was about to happen. He knows already, we've seen this very clearly all the way through chapter 17, chapter 16, in this whole discussion with his disciples, he knows very clearly what is about to happen. He's saying, hey, the hour has come for my glorification. At the beginning of John chapter 17, he knows he is about to suffer for Christ, for God, for us, uh, for the world. He knows he's about to, go, to die on the cross. He knows he's, his blood is about to be poured out. He knows he's going to be beaten to the point of almost death and then crucified. He knows all of the physical ramifications. He's the one that created humanity. Thus, he would know even more uh, in detail how the suffering he would be about to experience and how that would affect his body and how it would affect the, everything about him. And he knows exactly what is about to happen. This is a demonstration of his, his, um, his courage and his foreknowing. It's interesting that John points out here, Jesus, the first verse here, John 18, uh, verse 1 of, of the 18th chapter of John, Jesus, had, when he has spoken these words, right, we've, we're walking away from the upper room, uh, the discussion with the disciples, it's over, now Jesus is leaving, he went forth to his disciples over the brook Kidron, where is a garden into which he entered, and his disciples. Now you might even read over this and miss, and miss it, the brook Kidron is actually a very important point. And it's not mentioned, to my knowledge, I hope I don't say the wrong thing here, but to my knowledge, it's not mentioned in any of the other Gospels. I don't remember seeing it in any of the other Gospels. I'll put it that way. Maybe it is. But John wants to point this out specifically because that's an important place. And it would mean a lot. And it would actually be a testament, again, to Christ knowing exactly what is about to happen. See, the Brook Kudron is, is located on the eastern side of Jerusalem. 
If you remember, if you can imagine, well, I should probably switch this around. You can imagine, uh, for your sake, you imagine here's Jerusalem. On the eastern side is, is, um, is the, the Mount of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane, right? And it's basically a valley that runs in between Jerusalem and the Garden of Gethsemane. And you have to climb down because the, Jerusalem is up on a hill. You have to climb down to this valley, which is known as the Black Valley, first of all, because it's somewhat of a deep valley. It's a deep, a deep ravine, if you will. And it, sunlight is hard to get in there. And that's one reason it's called Black. There's another reason, which I'll get to in a minute. But you have to climb down to that brook and then climb back up to the Mount of Olives. So it's, a, it's somewhat of a journey. And so, if you will, there's the temple that's sitting there. I have to switch this around so that I don't mess things up here. Uh, so there's the temple. You have to cross over onto the eastern side, uh, and you have to cross the brook. The temple's up on a mountain, you remember. Now, what is happening right when Jesus crosses this? We're in the process of getting ready for Passover, right? And if for Passover, what do you do? You sacrifice a lamb. Every good Jew knows that. They brought lambs from all over the world, really. Jews have come back to uh, Jerusalem to worship God at the Passover, and they're sacrificing the lambs. Now, it's estimated, so I've heard a bunch of different numbers, some numbers of, say, 60,000. Uh, the one number I was reading out of the, of the book estimated over 100,000 lambs uh, were sacrificed. That's a lot of blood. So much blood that it would actually run down the side of that hill. Now, I understand that one of the, I think it was Augustine, don't quote me on this, but one of the emperors saw this black stain on the side of that hill uh, going down towards the brook Kidron, and he said, man, that's, that's just nasty. We need some way to wash this blood away. So he actually built an, a small aqueduct that would wash that blood down into the Kidron Creek. So Jesus, leaving southern Jerusalem, would have walked down that hill, and then, of course, this is in the spring, and so what happens in the spring when the rains, everything, we know, they're dry during the summer, right? But during the spring, they're flowing, right? That brook would have been flowing, probably could be up almost waist deep of water. And the, the blood would have been flowing down into that water. And by the time Jesus were, he would have been crossing across to go across the Mount of Olives, that water would have been red, flowing red. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew the significance of the Passover lamb, he, that he is what, behold, the lamb that taketh away the sins of the world. He knew what is about to happen, and he had to wade through that bloody water to go up to the Mount of Olives. He knew exactly what was going to happen. And John points this out, that even though they, the disciples, were walking through this blood, bloody water as they were about to cross with him up to the Garden of Gethsemane, they unknowingly, know about to, not knowing what is about to happen, but Jesus Christ knew exactly what it was about to happen. And John is saying, hey, he walked through that bloody water for knowing that it was going to be his blood uh, the ne very next day that was going to be poured out for the sins of all mankind. He knew exactly what was, what was happening. He knew exactly this was going to be his sacrifice. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2 says, and, a wa and I walk in love as Christ also has loved us and have given himself for us an offering a set to a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. This is a beautiful sacrifice, but it's a sacrifice nonetheless. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a sacrifice of Christ. It's a free gift, as we were learning about. There's a verse that was, that was saying today that was, the salvation is a gift of us, but that uses the Greek word that implies a sacrifice has to come along with that gift, or the giving of that gift. Both Jesus, Jesus and Judas knew that the garden was a vulnerable place. Right? And he points that out in verse 2. Judas also hath betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oftentimes resorted thither to his, with his disciples. So he knew Judas knew this was a, a place that you probably shouldn't go if you're worried about being arrested. Judas, having then, then having received a band of men and officers from the tree, chief priests and Pharisees, cometh hither, hither with lanterns and torches and weapons. What John wants you to know is that Jesus knew that Judas knew that the Garden of Gethsemane would have been the perfect place for his arrest. I think it was an accident that Jesus was praying in the garden at that time. He knew that Judas was coming back. He knew exactly what the disciples missed him. They didn't seem to realize he was gone. Uh, but Jesus knew exactly when he left. He told him, go ahead and leave. You better do what you need to do. 
And uh, the fact that he was praying in the garden, of course, there's all the symbolism of Christ praying in the garden, but John wants us to know that this is, and Jesus knew this. He knew what was about to happen. He knew exactly that this would be the perfect opportunity for Judas to lead the group to arrest him, to begin to start the events that proceed in this chapter, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He knows exactly what's happening. Jesus, so he knows that Judas knew that this was the place. Jesus also knowing that he was going to be crucified went out to meet his arresters. We see that there in the very next verse, verse 4. It says, wherefore, knowing all things that should come upon him. Again, if, if he's not saying it with what he's saying in the text here, the narrative, he says it out loud, right? Uh, John just blatantly says it. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things, right? He says it's no significance that he's crossing the brook Kidron. It's no significance that he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows that this is the perfect spot. Uh, the arresters of Jesus knew that they, if they didn't arrest him at night, uh, they could very much have a rough uprising. I mean, it was only a few days before we had Palm Sunday where everyone was celebrating Jesus Christ. Uh, he had a lot of followers. They had to do this secretly. Uh, it was a dangerous place for Jesus to be. Jesus knew all these things. That's what John wants you to know. He knows what's coming. He knows the circumstances. He knows that this is the perfect place for Judas to arrest him. And then he goes forward to meet them. He's the initiator. It's interesting. They're coming to arrest them. But John wants you to know that Jesus is still initiating. He's still calling the shots, even in the process of him being arrested. Uh, knowing all things that should come, come upon him, went forth. He approached them and said unto them, Whom seek ye? And if you're a policeman, you're arresting somebody, what's, what's the natural thing? You're the one. That's, if they're a bad guy, usually what are they doing? They're running away, right? They're fast they get out, and you've got to go tackle them, right? It used to be one time you, they'd shoot them in the leg or something, try to stop them from running. Now the policeman got to run, and they've got to be football players and, and tackle them, right? You've seen all the movies and everything. And uh, I always think it's interesting in the movies where they, they point the gun and tell them to stop. If, I mean, what criminal would ever stop? But anyways, and they're not allowed to shoot them, so... Uh, they've got to tackle him, right? The, the, the rest, person who's being arrested, they're always running away. But no, Jesus is the opposite way. He's approaching them. He walks up to them as they're coming in, and he says, hey, who are you looking for? Who do you seek? Who are you looking for? What do you guys want? And it's interesting. They're, they're taken aback at this, literally. Not just, not just figuratively, but also literally. So we see a demonstration of Christ's courage. We see his foreknowing. He knows exactly what's about to happen. He knows being in the garden is a dangerous place. He knows that he is going to be sacrificed for all mankind uh, to pay that payment for us. And he knows that he's, w and he's willing to do it. Uh, yes, did he struggle in his humanity? Yes. John's not trying to take anything from that story. That's a beautiful thought to think of Jesus not wanting to go to the cross but still being willing. But also John wants us to know that even though it looks like everything's out of control, Jesus is still in absolute control. He knows exactly what's about to happen. And he's still 100% calling the shots. He's still in control. And Jesus, he's demonstrating his divine foreknowing. Uh, we'll just use that word. Then we see a demonstration of Jesus' divine power. We'll add that in, right? A demonstration of Jesus' divine power, his divine power. Let's look at 4 through 6 here in the Gospel of John. And Jesus, therefore, knowing all things, should come unto them, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? So he initiates this. Excuse me. He speaks the first words to them. And his words have power, right? That's why there's no mistake that John, in the very beginning of this chapter, the beginning of this book, says in John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, when he's speaking of the word, it's more than just his, what he says. It, there's power. There's divine power. And that's what John is trying to say. They're completely 100% equal. And I'm going to demonstrate that with what, the next text, right? He's a good author. You don't, you, what do you do? You, you, when you're writing a paper, you say your opening statement is, this is what I want to demonstrate with what, the facts, right? And that's what John is doing. He says, hey... This is my opening statement. I want to demonstrate that the Word, Jesus Christ, is 100% equal with God Almighty. That they were there from the beginning. That they were equal. That they were working together, uh, making this sacrifice for all mankind. And then he's going to demonstrate with the facts his opening statement. And this passage here in John 18, 1-11 is another demonstration. He's saying, hey, 
Again, I'm going to re-highlight this. He is completely 100% in control. It looks like things are out of control, but Jesus is still in control. He's still God Almighty. Um, it's interesting that someone was pointing out that it's a very negative thing that some people present. And this has crept into Christianity, that Jesus was unknowing of what was going to happen, that he was just innocently, blindly led uh, to the slaughter. Yes, he was dumb uh, before his shears, but he knew exactly what was, in the, what was going to happen. He was not just some innocent random person that they ran out and grabbed and killed uh, for the sake of just killing somebody. No, they, everything was intentional. Jesus was in control of every moment. He is God. So he initiates the first words there, verse 4. And then what happens? What is the response to his words? Verse 5. Then they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed them, stood with him. He wants to point out exactly where Judas was standing when Jesus said, I am he. Because then he's going to say what happened, right? Then as soon as he said unto them, I am he, they went backwards and fell to the ground. So what does John want you to know? Even Judas fell to the ground. This is a powerful demonstration of Christ's power, of his, the fact that his divinity. I can assure you, I can't stand up here and tell somebody to fall over and they fall over the ground. If I do that, then maybe you should start wondering if I'm a good preacher because I'm exercising some other kind of power, right? But uh, Jesus Christ can do that. They all fell over. Uh, remember, uh, Jesus has them by what, it's two swords in their group, only 12 men. What do they come with? This huge group armed with all kinds of various weapons, probably temple guards and mostly soldiers, professional soldiers uh, in this group. They weren't Romans. They were probably Jews. But boy, when he says, I am he, they fall over. Now, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Why, why does this sound familiar? Let's ask ourselves again, again this question, right? And this is no accident why John highlights that they fell over right when he said, I am he. In fact, there is no he in the Greek. It's just ego in me, which is I am, right? Wait a minute. That sounds familiar. We've, we've been hearing that all through the Gospel of John, right? We've been hearing this over and over again, right? Let's go back. Uh, remember, first of all, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13, uh, we're gonna, which will be the next slide here, uh, we're going to remember, where does that come from? That comes from the burning bush when Moses says, hey, what am I supposed to call God to, to the Israelite nation? Uh, he says, verse 13, Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, they shall say unto me, What is his name? Okay? Moses is going to come to the people of Israel. Right? Remember, he's already tried going, trying to be their leader, right? Remember, he killed that one guy, and then he says, Okay, I'm going to judge between these two other, guy, two other Jews who are having an argument. And, they, and what did they tell him? They said, Hey, who do you think you are, buddy? Huh? Yeah? Yeah, you're going to come tell us what to do? You better have some authority next time you come back, right? So Moses knows if I just walk up to the Israelite nation and say, hey, I'm in, char I'm, you know, I'm in charge now, what are they going to do? They already told them. We're not interested, right? Just because you think you're an Egyptian prince doesn't give you any authority of us. Uh, we're not interested in following you. So he knows, hey, I better have God's name with me, right? I better say, God sent me to you, okay? And you better listen, right? So he says, hey, God, what is your name that I might call? Tell them that. What is thy name? And that what shall I say unto them? And God said unto them, I am that I am. Right? He, what he's saying is that, hey, when you're telling the Jewish nation about who God is, this is, what I want you to, this is what I want you to call me. I am that I am. Remember a good Jew at the time of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ they didn't read Hebrew anymore. They read, read the Bible in Greek. And they would have read it, ego in me, ego in me. They would have read these words exactly. When Jesus said there is a power to these words, and he is redefining exactly who he is, that he is God. And God said to him, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. When Jesus says these words, they know exactly. They're all Jews. Remember, there's no Romans in this group. Don't be, don't be confused. Romans come into the story later. The Jews bring the Romans into it, right? They bring Paul, uh, Pilate into it, and they have him you know, profess a trial. And then later on, it's Romans who crucify him. But these are, these are temple guards here. They're Jews, or at least have some kind of Jewish background. They wouldn't be serving as temple guards otherwise. They wouldn't be allowed into the temple 
So they're Jews, and when they hear these words, I am that I am, I am he, they fall over. They recognize this is not just a man. This is God. This is God that they're standing before. And like I said, this is a running theme through all of John. Let's go back through, and I know this is somewhat labor-intensive, but I want to remind you that this is something we've been seeing all through the Gospel of John. Remember, let's go back to John chapter 8. Where does this start? It was, there's I am statements before this, but Jesus qualifies this. John chapter 8, verse 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was I am. Remember earlier, Jesus says, hey, you know, there was Abraham. He rejoiced to see my day. And they're all looking at him like, man, this guy could at the most be 50 years old. How in the world could uh, he be around thousands of years before when Abraham was around? Uh, This doesn't make sense. And then he answers, all right, no, I was before Abraham. And he's basically saying that I am God. He's identifying himself with that Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 and 14 uh, verses. And they recognize it, because what's the next response, right? If you're looking at your Bible, you'll see they, what, took up stones to kill him. They, this was not, not just a regular old statement. They immediately recognized what he was saying, and they said, hey, we're going to kill this guy, because he's just blasphemed God. He's identified himself with God. He's just called himself God. <clears throat> that was just an interesting thought. Some, there are people claiming to be Jesus Christ out there. Boy, <laughs> What a dangerous place there, as a human. We, we don't ever want to claim to be God. But Jesus Christ can make that claim. And he does make that claim very clearly in this passage. And then John has that all throughout his Gospels. Remember John chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus said, said unto them, I am the bread of life. There's the seven I am's of John, which are, where he says, I am this, I am this. He's a qualification of, of the uh, I am statement. But again, he's reemphasizing the fact that he is God. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. John 6, 35. It says it again, John 8, 12. It says, Jesus spake unto them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John chapter 10, verse 9. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. John 10. 10, verse 14, which is our next slide. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known of mine. John eleven twenty five 25 uh, says, and 26 says, Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Every single one, what John is trying to say, he cannot be our bread of life. He cannot be our resurrection. He cannot be the light of the world unless he's God. And John is saying, hey, he's saying that he's God in every single one of these statements. He's saying, I can be this because I'm God. I can be the door because I'm God. I can be the good shepherd because I'm God. I can be the resurrection and the life because I'm God. John 14, verse 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Again, he's saying, I am God, and I can be the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, John 15, verse 5, which is our final one. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. And that is certainly the truth. Jesus is God, 100%. And John is requalifying that statement here in his narrative. He's saying, hey, when he says, I am he, they fell backwards to the ground, including Judas. Of course, then we have described in the other Gospels, Judas gets back up and then proceeds to, pro- proceeds to kiss him on the cheek, point out this is, this is the one to be arrested. And what happens? Jesus is then led away to, be, to take the trial uh, before the Sanhedrin and the high priest. So John is saying he is God and that he is saying that in this moment. Then we have a demonstration of Jesus' love, the, his divine love, right? We've seen his... We've seen the divine power. We've seen his divine love. Uh, We've seen his divine courage, his divine foreknowing. Now we see a demonstration of Jesus' divine love. Let's look at verses 7 through 9. Then uh, then asked he of them, saying, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. All right, they finally can get that out, right? They said it already before, and he said, Okay, who do you seek? I'm he. 
that he's 100% in control. There's the power here of, this, of the statement. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Uh, therefore, ye seek me. Let, the, let these go their way. And again, in the King James, you might kind of miss it. I think in the ESV it says, go ahead and let these men get away. Who was he referring to? He's saying, hey, you found me, right? I'm he. But also, please, let these guys go. Let these guys go. And who is he referring to? He's referring to the 12 that were there with him in the garden, or maybe a few more, right? There might possibly Mark could have been there. He talks about himself, or maybe possibly in that, in that passage. So he says, hey, don't take me, don't take them. He's demonstrating his divine love for them, the fact that he wants to give his life for them, not sacrifice his disciples for himself, but that he's willing to sacrifice himself for his disciples. That, say, that saying might be fulfilled, of his, which he spake, of them which thou gavest me, have I lost none. Where did he say that? Uh, well, let's go back to John uh, chapter 10, verse 11. Well, actually, I didn't put that in. Uh, but he said that previously, in the previous chapter, right? I will not lose any of these in John chapter 7, which thou givest me. And uh, in John chapter 10, verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd, uh, and I am willing to give my life, that giveth his life for the sheep. That's what qualifies him uh, to be the good shepherd. He's willing to die for his sheep. It's interesting, if we look back through history, uh, at some of the leaders of men, they weren't always willing to do that, right? They wanted their men to sacrifice their lives for them. Uh, the total opposite way. Uh, I think I've mentioned this in the past, that Hitler expected the German people, all of them, to die before him. Uh, he was upset that they weren't willing to do that uh, towards the end, where uh, the German people were realizing, hey, we've lost the war. We're, you know, we're, we're down to Berlin only. We're surrounded. Uh, this is over. We might as well just surrender rather than causing a complete destruction of Germany. Uh, and Hitler said, no, you've got to keep fighting. You've got to keep fighting to protect me. Every German should die before I should. And what a selfish thing. That's the total opposite thinking of Jesus Christ. But we can see that in other things. Even, even Napoleon, who constantly was talking about the love of his men for him and his love for them and all this stuff, even he, at the Battle of Waterloo, was persuaded to leave. At first he didn't, said he didn't want to, but then he took off, leaving his men to die. And even for us Scots, this is a hard one to admit, but even Bonnie Prince Charlie, right, at the Battle of Culloden, said he was going to stay and die with his men, but was persuaded to leave and left his men for a slaughter. Uh, the, the, the Scottish soldiers that were at Culloden, almost every single one were killed, not just killed, but killed in a brutal way. But the leaders of men usually fail in this regard, but Jesus says, no, don't arrest me. Don't arrest them. Arrest me. Take me. I'm willing to die for them. And that's what John says. He says, hey, when he said this back in chapter 17, that I'm willing to die for my, for I will not lose any of them, this is what he's talking about. He isn't going to lose any of them that night. Are any of the disciples going to be crucified with Jesus that night? Not a single one. Right? Some of them deny Christ, but I don't think even if they had not denied Christ, that they would have been crucified. It was only Jesus Christ. And he was willing to die completely for them. It's interesting that John records that Peter jumps forward, right, and, and uh, wants to take the initiative and defend Christ. He's inspired by the love of Christ. And he wants, that's the very next verse, verse 10. He says, Peter, having it, drew a sword, smote the high priest's servant, and cut off his right, name, right ear, and his servant's name was Malchus. So Peter, he said, hey, I'm ready to take it on. I'm willing to die for Christ, right? He just said that earlier. I'm willing to take your place. Uh, he's willing to do it. He's showing a demonstration, but Jesus says, no, this is not the time. Uh, I don't think he's rebuking the spirit, but he's rebuking the time. Peter's not aware that this is going to be an important moment uh, for Jesus Christ, that this has to happen. Uh, John chapter 17, verse 12 says, back on the love of Jesus Christ, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Oh, this is it. And thou, hast ga thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them have lost, but the son of perdition, which is the one who is to be sacrificed, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. It's a fulfilling of scriptures. This has to be done. And that brings us to our final point here, that Jesus knows that this is obedient. he's obeying his Father. Now again, we get this picture of obedience, that it's just this blind, leaders of the blind, and you just, you just follow whatever's being said. No, that's not true obedience. Obedience is knowing, hey, this is right for me, I'm going to follow in it, I'm going to be a part of it, 
and I'm going to willingly obey, right? Um, someone would have wrote a great, if you're interested in reading it, wrote a great article on church uh, discipline and church membership. You know, the word membership is never used in the Bible, right? I, I don't know if some of you have ever used it. Well, why do we have church membership, right? Church membership's never used in the Bible. Why do we practice that, right? Well, I think there's some great verses on that. But really, the point of church membership is not that you would come into the church and then we tell you all what to do. The point of church membership is the benefit for you. Because you submit yourself to God's authorities, which are people who are hopefully presenting God's word and, and helping you with that sanctification process. And when you willingly submit, submit, it's a benefit completely for you. And in fact, the reality for us church mem- for us in church leadership, we really don't have a way to punish you. God doesn't even give us a way to punish you. Because it's not our responsibility to punish you. Uh, we don't, we can't. If you walk outside of that, that protection, it's your loss. Right? That's what Paul says. They've left. We give them over to Satan because they wanted to leave. They didn't want to be a part of this protection. And we are now allowed Satan to attack them. It's nothing that the church leadership can do. In fact, the only thing that the church leadership can do when you dismiss, when you take yourself out from underneath the protection of the church, all we can do is grieve and be sorry that you left. The same with a husband, right? With a wife. I mean, the wife willingly submits, knowing, obeying the husband, right? And if she rejects that authority and steps out, is it his responsibility to beat her and make her come back? No. Come on. (laughs) No. That's not loving the church, loving his wife as Christ loved the church, right? No. His only response is grief. I'm sorry, right? If a husband steps out from the authority of the church, which is really where his authority comes, and steps out from the authority of God, God, what, is grieved. I'm sorry that you put yourself into that position, right? You gave yourself over to the attack of Satan. Obedience is a willingness. It's recognizing that this is the best thing. This is a good thing. There is a power. There is a strength here. And it actually demonstrates his divinity. The fact that he would know the power of this obedience. The fact that he is God because he's able to perceive into the mind of God, the plan of God, that God is going to make a sacrifice for us. And this obedience is really a beautiful thing. And really, that's the whole point of what Jesus is trying to say to Peter. Okay, because right, I mentioned Peter here, verse 10. He whips out that sword, and you might be a little bit confused on this passage. You're like, why did he go for a servant? I remember, maybe this was quite, this is a question maybe just I asked, right? Why didn't he go for the leader of the group? Well, actually, Malchias was the leader of the group. Him being the servant of the high priest meant he would have been in charge of the group. He would have been the general, as it were, standing there. Peter, he was going for the right guy, right? If you were going to stop this arrest, taking out Malchias would have been the perfect guy to go for, right? He was, he wasn't, Peter wasn't stupid. He was going for the right guy. And why did he chop his ear off, right? Well, you got to think about it. With a sword, you're trying to hit somebody, and somebody, what do they do? They dodge, right? Which would have been a natural response on Malchias' part. If somebody was swinging a sword at you, I'm sure you would have probably done the same thing. Right? He, he dodged, and as he dodged, what? It missed Peter aiming for his head, missed, and took off his ear. Right? So Peter, he he's, thinks he's doing the right thing. Right? He's perfectly sincere. I don't think there's anything wrong with his sincerity. I think him loving Christ, being willing to die for Christ, fight for Christ was a good thing. Jesus himself says, that, hey, if my kingdom was of this world, my servants would fight. He told, uh, he told Pilate that later on, and not only we fight, we'd win. Uh, Because the Spirit is there. Peter's willing. He's willing to jump out and fight for Christ. But it's the wrong time. And that's why Jesus says, hey, I'm going to touch this guy's ear. I'm going to put it back the way it was. Heal him completely. His enemy. And he's going to tell Peter, hey, put up your sword. Put up your sword. This is not the time. Even though you are willing to fight and defend me, it's not the time. I, I, I need to go and die for the cause of Christ. And that's the beauty of, you know, of defense. You know, we, we, a father is to defend his children. A mother is to defend her children. Uh, she, we don't ask somebody else to turn the other cheek. We turn our own. Uh, Jesus is telling you personally. You don't tell your children, I'm not going to defend you kids because, from any attacker because uh, I'm supposed to let you guys turn your cheek. No. But if they're willing to turn the cheek, then that takes the defense away. We don't need to have that anymore because Christ is willing to sacrifice himself. I love a quote from Theodore Roosevelt. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how 
uh, the strong man stumbles, nor the doer of deeds uh, could be done them better. The credit belongs to the man who actually is in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and, or in shortcomings, but who actually strives to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who, is, who at the best knows at the end of triumph and high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. So this is a place, so his place shall never be with those who cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Sometimes we as Christians, we get this mindset that obedience is just sitting back and not doing anything. And that if I just don't do anything, I won't do anything wrong. That's not the case. Obedience is action. When we obey Christ, we move. Yet, are we going to make mistakes? Yes. We might, we're going to make mistakes. We're human. Peter was human, 100%. He jumped out at the wrong time, cut the wrong guy's ear off, did it all wrong, right? But I think God still loved that sincerity, that desire to try to do it. Even if I did it wrong, I'm going to try anyways. You know, too many Christians, oh, we're so huddled back into our hole, we're so retreating, that we're, and we're so afraid of doing something wrong, we don't do anything at all. But, you know, what Jesus is the complete opposite. He not only knows the right time when to do things, the right place, he has complete wisdom. I love how... Um, Richard is always reminding us wisdom is the time, knowing when to do something and the right time to do things because there's a time for love, there's a time for war, there's a time for all these different things, but knowing when to do those things is wisdom. Jesus not only knows the right time, but he's also obedient. He takes that initiative, right? He's been initiating this whole thing, right? In, in bat, co combative strategy, the initiator is the one that, that becomes the victor eventually because he's, he's, he's directing what's going on. The fact that he moves first, even if it's the wrong move, He's doing it right. But Jesus is 100% perfect. And he knows the plan of the Father. And he's willing to take that plan and be obedient. And that's what he says in verse 11. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword and thy sheath. The cup which thy Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? He's saying, hey, this is the point. This is the hour. This is the time. He doesn't tell him, hey, you shouldn't have done that. You're, you're just a crazy man, Peter. You should, you, no, because I mean... Peter later does the wrong thing again. What does he do? He denies Christ when asked about him. But Jesus says, hey, no, this is not the time. This is not the place. I am ready to suffer. I'm willing to give my life for the sheep. Jesus is willing to know and follow the plan that the Father has for him. That's true obedience. He is more than willing to suffer for us. Um, John chapter 10, verses, chapter 10, verses 14 through 18 says, I am the good shepherd, ye know my sheep, I am known of mine, and the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father, and lay down my life for the sheep. He's giving his life for us. The other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them I must also bring, which is us, right? Those that get saved later. And, and they hear my voice, and they shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it. There's this love between the Father and the Son, because they have the same heart's desire. Right? What's the hardest thing for a father to do is to give his son. What's the hardest thing for anyone to do is to give their life, which is what Jesus Christ did. They both sacrificed the hardest thing for us. And they love each other because... They have this love. They're in one united in this plan, this love for us. No man taketh, from me, taketh it from me. I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment I have received of my Father. Did Jesus, was Jesus forced into what's these next events, the crucifixion? What John wants us to know is no, he wasn't. He was completely aware of what was coming. He was ready for it. Like he said, he could have easily avoided. Even probably the disciples that were there with only two swords and a willing spirit probably could have easily overwhelmed the group uh, of arresters, even though they were probably better armed than them. But not only that, Jesus Christ himself, he points out, hey, I could call 10,000 angels to stop this from happening. 
There's so many different ways Jesus could have stopped this from happening, but he didn't. Why? Because he knew that it had to be done for you and me. What, what had to be done? What? That's our next question. Questions are a good thing, right? What we've been studying in our Sunday school class, and you know, we deal with one subject, and then a question comes, right? If you explain anything, there should always be questions, right? If you do a good job, I think. Why did Jesus have to die for me, right? That's the question we're left with this morning. Why was this so important? It's so important because it's our only way to heaven, right? Jesus saith, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. This sacrifice was important. Are you willing to accept it? Are you willing to believe it? Are you willing to take it? We're going to go through it as we go through the events here in the next few weeks. Let's go to bow for prayer to close. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for us. Lord, I, I do pray that we're left with that question this morning. Even those of us that are believers who should know, or, or, who, or who do, or maybe who think we know, <laughs> the reason that you came and died for us. Even we should be left with the question, why did you do that for me? Paul quote, was left with that question when he said, I am the chief of sinners, yet Christ was willing to die for me. We should have the same attitude where we say, hey, I am the chief of sinners. I, I'm the one that should be the, the least that Christ would die for. But yet he did. And Lord, that we would all deal with that question. Think about that question. Be motivated by that question. Questions motivate us. Lord, to seek you, to speak of you, to teach of you, to learn of you. Lord, I pray that you bless us this week as we follow your example, that we would slowly uh, become more and more like Christ, overwhelmed by the love of Christ. Lord, that beautiful verse, uh, how can we comprehend the height, the depth, the breadth, the width of your love? We can't. It, it, it's, it, it, is, it is a fourth dimension that we don't even understand. But yet, as we begin to walk into it, we start to see it a little bit more at a time, and we become overwhelmed with it. And Lord, I just pray this morning that love would be the motivator, that we'd be continually driven on by love and the truth of your love. I pray these things in your name. Amen. All right. At this time, we have time of sharing. Uh, we got a, I guess we're going to have Frank Elliott.